Let's get ready. Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting to order for our July 25th, 2017 Multidisciplinary Advisory Committee meeting. So thank you all for, for being here today. Let us have a uh, roll call. Dr. Klingborg. Here. Dr. Drusis. Dr. Grant. Dr. Pollard. Here. Dave Johnson. Here. Christy Pulowski. Here. Diana Woodward Hagel. Here. Jennifer Laredo. Here. And Dr. Sullivan. Here. We do have quorum. At this stage, I'd like to have anybody from the audience that would like to introduce themselves. It is voluntary. Uh, Nancy Ehrlich, Carta. Leah Schufeld, CD Mayor and Chief Committee. Cindy Savely, Sacramento Valley Vet Tech Association. Ralph Instrumaker, CBMA. Cheryl Waterhouse, Veterinary Medical Board. Candace Rainey, Veterinary Medical Board. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, review and approval of the minutes from our uh, meeting on April 18th. I just had one minor typo yep. that I found. Um, page 6 of 9, the very last line. Uh, I think it's supposed to say presently instead of present. Refer to the services to another facility within a veterinarian. It, is your microphone on? I'm a low talker, okay. sorry. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. One correction, uh, it's really an addition. Page five of nine, under item eight, Ms. Delmanio noted that she, it should be comma, Dr. Sullivan, comma, and Dr. Klingborg met with the Board of Pharmacy. I left you off. That's okay. You were there. I was there telephonically. Yeah. Other additions, corrections? Tara? Yeah. Page two, item four, last line. Insert a space between whether the item four, last line. Oh, gotcha. Page three, about halfway down, the paragraph that starts with Dr. Klingbord clarified that strike the. Page four, first bullet, last line, change hig to high. Middle of the page, in the paragraph that starts, Ms. Welch noted. Um, second line up, at the very end, it says, and their DEA, change their to his or her. Further down, uh, two paragraphs down, it starts with Dr. Alan Drusis. Last line, anesthesia by Ann, strike the D. That's all. I thought whether that was a new word, like <laughs> can be. Okay. We can make it work. Any, any other additions, corrections, audience? Motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor, we need a voice vote on this, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Klingborg? Yes. Dr. Pollard? Yes. Dave Johnson? Yes. Christy Pulowski? Yes. Diana Woodward Hagel? Yes. Jennifer Laredo? Yes. And Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Great. Thank you. Agenda item number four, update from the complaint process audit subcommittee. It's Drs. Pollard and Dr. Grant. Uh, Dr. Grant is here, but speaking for him, we made um, valiant attempts to get together since the last meeting, and we're not successful, so we don't have an update. Okay. Fair enough. 
Any questions from the committee? Okay. Questions from the audience? You know, agenda item number five, discussion and consideration of extended duty for registered veterinary technician regulations, potential recommendation to the board. Um, so there's a whole bunch of information that was on the back table over there. And um, we have a subcommittee that did some work on this. It's a complicated uh, topic. And so I'd like to have the subcommittee go ahead and give their report, and then we'll just kind of try and work our way through it. So Jennifer and I spoke about this, and thank you. And what we did, we kind of talked about how we wanted to approach this. And the first thing we talked about was to look at how the procedures were performed and then whether or not they were being taught as part of the current curriculum in RBT schools. She talked to a few schools, I talked to a few schools and found out what they were, you know, if they were being taught in the current curriculum. Yes, they are being taught in the current curriculum, some more than others, some were just mentioned, some are being taught in, um, as part of practical experience. Some are just mentioned because it's not something that they practice every single day. That's part of your report. The feeling, the general feeling on these functions, and I can, I mean, I can think I can speak for Jennifer. <laughs> she can chime in. Is that we, we feel that these functions, I don't know that this is something we need to be considering as a committee as something that we need to be, that this is a purview of this committee or of the Veterinary Medical Board. It feels that it should be something for the veterinary profession if they would like to educate veterinarians as to whether or not RVT should be performing these out in the field then it is the veterinarian's discretion to decide who should be performing these. And that is already stated in the Practice Act. So um, that should be really left up to the veterinarian to decide who performs these. And that's, if, if RVTs think that an RVT needs to be performing these, then let the RVTs use the profession to educate veterinarians and say why it's important. But I, I caution us in moving forward um, to decide and make any type of regulation that says we need to say these are just RVT only duties. Yes, Jennifer. And just to add a little bit to what Christy said, I think our original intent was very different from what this has evolved into. but. The primary concern with, and I, I, I think for CARTA also, was that veterinary assistants were performing these tasks. So with the regulations already being in the Practice Act, maybe um, one of those could be beefed up a little bit in the wording, but it, it is already in there that veterinary assistants should not be performing these tasks because we have identified some of the um, skills that already are in regulations. So I agree with Comments from the committee? Sounds reasonable to me. Sure. Sounds reasonable to me. Okay, uh, from the public. Yep. Nancy. Uh, I'm a little bit mystified what you folks just said because the Practice Act, the the legislation in the Practice Act specifically states that it is the duty of the Veterinary Medical Board to determine job tasks for both RVTs and veterinary assistants. So it is your job to decide these things. And you know whether you like this list or not, that's a different story. But it's not something that is, that is always supposed to be left up the, to the veterinarian. It, it is the decision of the Veterinary Medical Board to determine job tasks. Uh, CARFTA did have a, we had a board meeting last week and we came up with what we thought was a better idea than the one we had originally presented to you. Uh, 
as I had mentioned at the last meeting, we thought, I thought that it was going to be rather cumbersome to have a whole a new list of extended duties. Uh, we, had, we had actually started off that way back in the 70s with long lists of job tasks for both technicians and assistants and uh, ended up getting rid of it because it was unwieldy. And that the better, a better idea is to have a general concept. And at the last meeting, I said something about well, it should be restricted to duties uh, requiring the skills and knowledge of an RBT, but then really thought about that that's too vague and that no one would really know what that meant. So we came up with a, what we think is a better idea, is, is to, that we believe that uh, we should restrict to our, delegating to an RVT any procedure involving the placement of a needle or an appliance into a blood vessel, cavity, or epidural space, which then encompasses oh, probably 90% of the procedures that were on that list. Could you repeat that list? Yes. Any procedure involving the placement of a needle or an appliance into a blood vessel, cavity, or epidural space. Okay. I think so, I left out the word body cavity. The so word. you're moving away, CARD is moving away from the list and is suggesting that we consider this language. Right. We also would suggest uh, including in the definition of inducing anesthesia the roots of administration of the anesthesia to include inhalation, injection by any root, topical and oral, to make it clear that only an RVT can induce anesthesia by any route. So I think it's difficult for the committee to discuss it at this point without having had a chance to ponder right. it. Um, and what I'd like to do is have you submit the language so that I can share it with the subcommittee who can then take on that task. And then we come back at our next meeting and discuss that language. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Can we even discuss it because it's not on, I mean, technically, can we discuss it? Yeah, okay, that's why I want to make sure if we can discuss it. <laughs> I want to make sure, too. So. I'll get it to you in writing. Great, okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public on uh, agenda item number five, extended duties? Um, I would like to just get clarification from council and this might be something council needs to do a further investigation, but uh, Ms. Ehrlich was referring to Business and Profession Code 4836, uh, defining tasks of technicians and veterinarians, and it says the board may adopt by regulations, um, may adopt regulations establishing animal health care tasks that may be performed by a veterinary assistant as well as an RVT. Um, it does say the board shall establish appropriate degree of supervision uh, by an RVT or a licensed veterinarian over a veterinary assistant for any task established under this section in the degree of supervision. And it goes on to say, shall be higher for a veterinary assistant or equal to the degree of supervision for that for an RVT. So um, just clarification, May here is, is permissive about establishing those regulations that define the animal health care tasks that may be performed by a veterinary assistant where the supervision is shall. So there is a difference between um, something permissive, the board may do by regulation, versus the board must do this because it's called out in statute. So I wanted to make that clear, and I wanted to ask council's opinion on that. I would agree with that interpretation. Okay, thank you. Uh, arguably, um, the, the may in the statute leaves it up to the board to decide what is appropriate to um, delineate with respect to tasks and what would be appropriate to leave up to the veterinarian. Um, but yeah, then that second part, requiring the board to determine the level of supervision, that's pretty clear. Any other comments from the public, uh, from the committee? 
Dr. Klingdorf? Yes, I This am. was a handout. Who prepared this? Me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm fully responsible for any inaccuracies that are in that. But I was trying to create some understanding. Now that we we're getting away from the laundry list of the specific tasks, I think that actually is the right direction, and uh, we'll move forward. Okay. All right, speaking of moving forward, let's move on to agenda item number six. Discussion and consideration of recommendations from State Humane Association of California and the CVMA regarding public and private shelters and uh, protocols. And so, uh, is there a report, Val? Nothing? Okay. Um, and so, Shaq and, and CVMA are, are working on this. In the meantime, I, I tasked Dave Johnson uh, to look at some of this because he lives in this world and understands many of these issues and uh, so I was going to kind of turn this over to him as we try and make some headway on this topic. Thank you for setting me up. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that, doctor. So, some headway. I didn't say it was all going to be solved. Um, I wanted to, uh, we obviously have been talking about this issue on a regular basis since I think 2015 and I, I don't believe that any new issues have been identified. Um, I think most of the concerns have already been put down on paper by all the organizations and so I think we need to start looking at exactly then in what form or how do we want to address uh, these issues um, and some of them I think is just clarification uh, of the issues from the veterinary board and legal counsel in terms of defining because we're, we're trying to make the Veterinary Practice Act fit all practice methods uh, and all practice situations which for the most part it works but there are some unique situations in, in all of these different settings that may require either a wording change or just an interpretation of how that section of the Practice Act is going to be applied. Uh, and I'm just picking these in no specific order, but some of the topics that were brought up in Erica's uh, uh, information that she sent us, there was a statement in there about uh, they wanted clarification on the euthanasia of wild animals. And uh, the way I read the Practice Act, that clarification is already there. Uh, the language says domestic, anim domestic pets or animals. So it's just a matter of the board saying, yes, you have the authorization. And I can tell you, uh, as the controlled substance permit holder for an animal shelter, when I reviewed the inventory of the officers, probably 50% of what the officers euthanize in the field is uh, injured coyotes, injured raccoons, skunks, possums, uh, depending upon your location in the state of California, deer, uh, bobcat, mountain lion, something of that nature. And so I think the Practice Act already covers that. I've asked legal counsel or just informally, I brought it to her attention so she could review it. And so it just depends upon how you read that section because animals are already defined in the Practice Act to include all wildlife. That definition is already there. And then the section that authorizes the euthanasia of them by shelter personnel, uh, you just have to look at how you want to interpret the placement of the words and where the commas are. And if that's not going to make a correct application for the shelter community, then all we need to do is just adjust or clarify that sentence. So either the board needs to say, hey, this section covers it and it's okay to euthanize animals by this is our interpretation, or we just need to amend that section. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, one of the others that keeps coming up uh, is we need to take a look specifically at uh, 2032.1, the veterinary client-patient relationship. And we kind of keep skipping over that one and forgetting to come back to it. And that has to do with the fact that in the shelter world, humane officers and animal control officers by the authority under 597 in the penal code will seize an animal for lack of veterinary care. And then the law mandates that that animal receive 
veterinary care. They will not establish, or the shelter or the doctor treating that animal will not establish the BCPR with the owners because this is a legal situation. And so they just need to, we just need to modify that section and just add in there where it says animal uh, owner unknown, then just put a comma, or animals seized under Penal Code 597. And that would clarify the situation. Um, but the law mandates these animals get veterinary care, and you're not going to call the owner. The owner may be in jail. Uh, the owner may be very hostile towards what has happened, and it's not possible to establish that standard working relationship with them to get permission to treat their pet. And actually, by law, you don't need permission to treat their pet. So that would be one of the areas that we need to take a look at. So, Dave, do you want to talk about these individually? You want to run through the laundry list? I was going to run through the laundry list okay. just to put the topics out there, and then I thought we could come back and people could express their support concerns or, or whatever. Um, some of them that Erica has brought up, I think, have already been clarified with regards to whether the uh, controlled substance permit. I think the board made a very clear statement on that. And so I think that information just needs to get out to the shelter community. And I think some of the concerns that were raised, uh, that has already been clarified very uh, specifically in that memo that came out, I believe, at the last meeting, at the last veterinary board meeting. Dave, can I ask a question? Yes, um, so just so we're all following along in the book here, are you talking about controlled substances number two? Because um, well, she the, kind of brings it. Well, she has several different right. times she brings it up. Um, but see, there's an amended um, handout where we took out all of the stuff on controlled yeah. substances. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. That's not what I scribbled on. There. So yeah, there's there's really only five items now on the updated. It was updated 718 of 17 that oh, Erica. I missed that. I'm sorry. That's yours. My yeah. apologies. There's six. We just. Twice. Oh, there yeah. you go. There's six. Yeah. Um, so Erica sent an updated outline because of the fact that at the last meeting, council reviewed. Right. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I will um, redo my thoughts then. Um, no, no, no. My error for, <laughs> for not having the updated one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, it's, it's tough to stay up to date when things are coming in a week before the meeting. Yes. Um, so anyway, then uh, obviously that one has been taken care of, and uh, we, I did address number three. What is um, the update? Yeah. The top of the document says high priority shelter related issues seven eighteen seventeen. I didn't get one. I didn't get one either. Okay, I so they were sent out via email on the eighteenth, but we should have copies in the back. Um, are, are they part of this packet, Nina? Okay. So Nina, actually, yes, they're, they're labeled for you in the packet. So if you look at item six, it's it's labeled all of these were extended duties. Uh, second to the last oh. document, item six. Oh, I see. Yep, it's here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I already covered one that's not on this topic, so. That's <laughs> okay. I'll go back then. Um, I'll start at their number one list, uh, the one number one on the list then. Um, the veterinary care on intake, um, the vaccination of animals, the fleet, applying fleet treatment to animals, worming animals, testing for diseases is pretty much the established standard of care nationwide in animal shelters now, and that has been a kind of a procedural change that has developed over the last decade, and it now is considered standard practice in the shelter community nationwide. In fact, if you're not doing um, those procedures upon intake, uh, you're considered not practicing the appropriate level of care for the animals. And so I think we need to somehow bring the Practice Act up to match what is occurring and actually uh, happening in the real world out there. And just to remind everyone, for probably the last five years plus, the board had a policy that allowed this. And then obviously Anne Marie brought it to everyone's attention that policies have to be based upon factual law. 
And but for years, this has been on the website for the veterinary board saying, hey, it's okay to do all these things in a shelter situation. And so again, I think the board getting back to what was just read, they have the authority to define tasks for veterinary assistance and for uh, RVTs and the level of supervision that is required. And so uh, I think it is time to create a separate section in the code of regulations that talks about veterinary care in a sheltered situation and specifically then lay this out and authorize these services so that there is the wording in the law to match exactly what is happening. I still think it needs to be overseen by a veterinarian, either that veterinarian approving the protocols or something of that nature. It can't just be them independently doing these things on their own. Um, the issue with the controlled substances, um, that's going to be an interesting one to address uh, because I think we need to get some guidance from the DEA. Um, everyone talks about the, the use of euthanasia solution, but what Erica has brought forward is because animals are fractious in a shelter environment, because some animals are dangerous, uh, other animals are in pain and hurting, uh, they're pre-sedated. And again, that is uh, the standard of care that has developed in the shelter community. And the most common pre-euthanasia sedation involves controlled substances. And so shelters will either use telazole or they will use xylazine and ketamine. And so, and this is sedation prior to euthanasia. And so this is a very common procedure. Uh, and as she states, gone are the days where you're, you can give certain types of injections. And I'm glad the Attorney General has made those rulings because they were very inhumane and painful to the animals. But we now need to bring our regulations up to speed in that these are going to be done on a regular basis without a veterinarian examining the animal prior to this happening. And these drugs are re being used every single day out there. So that's one of the areas that we need to most certainly uh, discuss more and take a look at. Number four, the business and profession codes. Um, I'm not sure that section needs to be changed. And, and, and here's my thoughts on this, is that RVTs and veterinary assistants are both already authorized to perform tasks and work wherever the practice of veterinary medicine occurs. And although it only mentions RVT, that section does talk about city, state, or whatever. And so what happens is a humane society comes in and provides the animal control services via contract. So technically, they are running a city shelter, okay? They have independently outsourced the services to Humane Society. So to me, it's already covered that they're there providing those services. I'm not sure we need to insert the word Humane Society in there. I think it's broad enough uh, to allow them uh, to be covered. And again, that is just my opinion. I have no problems with it being inserted in there, but that's a legislative change. And I always prefer to work in the regulatory world. I think it's a little easier sometimes. Um, on to rabies vaccine then. And again, this is one I know, Dr. Sullivan, you said at one of our meetings that you thought the veterinary board had very little control. And, and I would agree with you with one exception. The California Department of Public Health determines the vaccine that is used, the type of vaccine that's used, the administration of that vaccine, at what age that vaccine is given, what information goes on the health certificates, what quarantine periods are. They've got total control of it, except for one area, which is how it is administered. And so I think the veterinary board has the authority to set the standards for how and under what circumstances that vaccine is given. And in the shelter world, the reason the, the issue came up was we have this public uh, access to service issue. And the example was used that every shelter handles it differently. So they come to claim in an animal that was uh, impounded for running stray. It's Friday afternoon and the veterinarian has gone home. 
And so what is the shelter to do? And I can tell you there's three different scenarios that occur throughout the state of California. You've heard from people that say, we tell the people there's no veterinarian on duty, come back Monday. And I think that is unfair to the public and that is not a good service. You have other shelters that go, well, veterinarian's not here, but we're not gonna keep this animal over the weekend. So they vaccinated and sent it out the door. And there is no rabies police out there. Uh, public health doesn't come in and say, oh wow, you vaccinated the dog without it. And unless the public whose dog had a problem filed a complaint with the veterinary board, it's never going to be known. Or the other option is some of the animal shelters issue what we call fix-it tickets. And it's like, your dog doesn't have a vaccine, we're gonna issue a ticket. And then they have this bureaucratic mess in a pile getting this high of fix-it tickets that nobody ever follows up on. And so I think realistically, you need to look at that and determine how you can address the needs of the public as well as meshing with what public health requirements are. I can tell you that I know of shelters that have decided on their own, since there's no direction from the board, that as long as there is a veterinarian somewhere within the shelter system, it may be at another location, they will just either text them, email them, or call them on the phone and say, hey, we have a dog here that's being claimed, can I give it a rabies vaccination? Now, that dog has not been examined, okay, so it, it, there's a problem there, but I think this is one we really need to take a look at and resolve because it is occurring on a regular basis by the hundreds at shelters throughout California. Um, and then the last one would be uh, just most certainly there are a lot of tasks that are going to be performed uh, under indirect supervision, and I, I think Again, the board just needs to clarify what written or direct orders are. And I'm pretty liberal on written. I consider in this day and age where computers are all hooked up, uh, again, in a multi-shelter situation for government, you could have a uh, doctor, you could be in Carlsbad and I could be down in San Diego and you're looking at that animal's record and you can be typing in a written record, a written order right into that record. Uh, based upon your examination of the, uh, of the record. Or a written order can be an established protocol. And, and I think, again, we need to clarify that in definition in that separate section that we're talking about, that a written order could be interpreted as either something directly put in the individual animal's record or as a established protocol that has been re uh, reviewed. Um, and I think that pretty well covers most of the issues that have come up over the last couple of years. Um, yes. Um, and then the sedation one is being addressed separately as a separate topic, and that, that is a huge, a huge issue. So I will quit talking. That's my overview. <laughs> Great. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go through them one by one. Any general comments at this stage? Are we ready to start at one and head, head south? All right, let's do it. Veterinary care on intake. So again, in regards to this issue, I guess as we look at this, I have a, a question here. Physical exam, is that a protected term? I mean, can only a, a doctor perform an exam or... Is, 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 do we need to use the word assessment? I'm not, I'm not sure philosophically where we are with that. I'm not sure philosophically or legally, but because I'm paranoid and I like to follow rules, I always call it my observation, um, just so that I'm not making a diagnosis. Even though the dog may be, um, may have a fever, I don't call it febrile. I said, you know, this, these are my observations, this is the temperature, so that's a great question. Okay. And then as we look at the other uh, sub-items, B, C, well, B and C here, vaccines and prophylactic treatment of parasites, are those things that are not allowed in a shelter setting right now? Is, is, that, is that what I need, to, unless the veterinarian's involved? Is that well, again, it gets back to how you're interpreting and applying the Practice Act. I mean, under the strict interpretation of the Practice Act today, every one of those animals needs to be examined first 
and uh, then any of these things, because they're considered the practice of veterinary medicine, then they could take place. And so the items that are listed here are what we would consider either a wellness item or something that needs to be done to protect the overall health of the shelter as a whole for biosecurity purposes. So then there's really two kind of issues here that fall under veterinary care on intake. And number one is this whole notion that the veterinary needs to be generally acquainted with the health of the animals and all of that. Right. And, and this is where those, when I talk about written orders, this is where those protocols come in. And whether it's where a veterinarian has been involved and is established and written and approved an intake protocol. So it's very specific. This is what is going to happen, and I want you to do on intake. Anything that falls outside the parameter of this gets referred to a veterinarian and needs a full examination. Yes, Amory and then Dick. So this is clearly something in statute for RVTs, that they don't have to wait for the physical exam or the examination by the veterinarian, because there's an exception to that under 4840B. Um, and you mentioned, Dave, in your um, review of all the items that you didn't feel as though anything needed to be added to this section on private shelters. So that's kind of a separate topic, but it does get confusing when we talk only about state, city, county, or city and county agencies. Right. Um, I think what this does is this opens it up to shelter staff that may not be RVTs. And, and that's what the issue was, right. was that you know, as much as I'd like to say, gee, it should be an RVT to ever shelter, realistically, it is not. I can tell you that in my shelter world, almost 50% of the uh, intake, well, I'll take that back, probably 75% of the intake was done by non-RVTs right. because it was either the senior kennel staff or it was the animal patrol officers. So I would suggest that this would be a statutory amendment because it clearly states in that section that RBT is exempt from having to have a delegation to do this. Right. And if you're looking to do the same for, you know, veterinary assistants working in the setting, um, you know, these are the mechanics of it. But it looks like it would be very closely aligned with what's already in 4840 but for a veterinary assistant. And if, in fact, that's the desire of the board moving forward, you could then amend that section to make it more clear that this could be private shelters that are under contract as well. Do you think it needs to be, if they already have the authority to adopt tasks and level of supervision, why does it need to be a statutory change? You have the authority to adopt tasks, but this would be a carve out of what's done in a animal hospital where the veterinarian is exercising some degree of supervision. So, direct order, written order, telephonic order. There was a reason why the statute was written clearly as something other than supervision when they were talking about RVTs performing these duties in shelter medicine. So that it doesn't, it's separate from what would happen in a private right. practice situation. Right. And it's also a degree of independence. Correct. So, yes. So, my feeling is that based on how this is constructed, mm -hmm. in order to be clear that you're not now opening up veterinary assistance in any setting to be able to do things right. without the exercise of some form of supervision outside of a direct order, a written order, a telephonic you just order. Think it's cleaner. I, I think it makes it okay. more clear for the setting that this is a setting specific exemption in statute. Um, well, I'm looking at this area totally different, differently. Um, I'm looking at this as a large animal practice, uh, uh, treating a, a herd. The veterinarian has a knowledge of the record keeping, has a knowledge of the animals that are there, and is assigning tasks to people to take care of those animals. He's not there treating each individual or whatever. I think that's what the VCPR allows us to do in a shelter setting. 
I think that's what we should adapt to, not necessarily writing a whole new section. I'm just, I mean, when I, when I looked at this and, and when we worked at it uh, on the CVMA committee that's uh, in this packet, that's kind of how I was approaching it. Uh, I don't see any massive um, need to make massive changes in the Practice Act. Um, we're, we're taking a small animal situation and making it a herd situation. So that, uh, I mean, veterinarians all the time tell herd managers, this is the protocol for mastitis. This is the protocol for X, Y, Z. I think, I think that's what we're trying to do here. I, I would agree with you, Dr. I, I mean, I, I, I like that interpretation, but are you talking about then just amending the wording of the VCPR? Because it's in there already. You, you think it can be applied for, uh, to me, the VCPR is more for an individual animal, not for a herd situation. Well, let's, uh, let's see. What, uh, I think the VCPR, it, it becomes a challenge in the shelter setting when you've got an impounded animal specifically, where there's an, an own, a known owner, and well, there's a known owner in her. Yeah, but you're 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 not actually following the aspects of the VCPR because if the animal's been impounded, you're not calling the owner and saying I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to your pet. That animal is getting veterinary care probably through the shelter setting because the owner wasn't providing that. Okay. Um, so, so there was just simply a discussion about whether or not the BCPR needs to be amended in some way to have some wiggle room for impounded animals, and that's that's what, where I thought you were trying to go. Uh, well, I'll have to re look at this again. I was I, I was when we were writing the the, the uh, recommendations for duty, duties of the supervising veterinarian that is in the packet. That's the framework I was coming from, that the, the veterinarian has knowledge of the animals, the setting, the records, and is assigning tasks to that. And um, Emory? I think you could make that work, but you would have to amend this section, and you would have to be more specific, because if you look at 2032.1b, which starts out what the VCPR, what must happen in order for the VCR to be established, you won't be able to check all those boxes in a shelter setting. There's a few of them that work, but not all of them. So I think regardless of whether you approach it like herd health or whether you say this is a setting that's exempt from establishing a VCPR, you could go either way, but you're still going to have to amend this section. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about exemptions. Okay. I, I like to fit everything in the same arena so that, you know, I think we get into trouble down the road when we exempt I'm, the practice. Yeah. So. Dave and Christy. Um, you can go first. Well, I, just, I have concerns <coughs> about exemptions for private. That's my concern. I, I really want us to stick with the the municipalities. So that is my biggest concern. And I understand that if they, if they contract with the municipality, that is completely different, but they should fall under that <coughs> municipality and that city or county. But we should not be looking at exempting any type of, um, of private shelter in any way. I don't think that helps us. Um. I'm kind of keying off Christie's comment. What's the definition of a shelter? Where is it in the VPA? Where is it in where? The practice. Right, it's not here. I mean, there's not a definition of shelter. Okay. And the only... I think there should be. Oh, I think there's a lot of things <laughs> to be defined. I, I would... I would support a whole bunch of definitions. <laughs> and, and I would guess there's a definition for shelter in either the penal code or right. one of yeah, the well, other in, sections. In, in the um, uh, food and ag code, they're just referred to as depositories, which can be a shelter or 
whatever is defined there. And then just to clarify my statement I was made earlier about the Humane Societies having contracts, I'll use San Diego County as an example. The city of Oceanside, it's the city of Oceanside shelter, and they contract with a Humane Society to run that. The city of Escondido, it is the city of Escondido shelter, and they contract through outsourcing contracts to have that shelter run. And many municipalities go that way, but you are a city municipality shelter or a county shelter, and by contract, an agency, or it doesn't even have to be a main society. It could be a private veterinarian come in and agree to do it, but it's still a public shelter. Okay? It's not a private humane society that sets their own rules and regulations. Well, then I think whenever in the VPA shelter is used, the word shelter, it should reference whatever other code defines shelter. Yeah, and, and I, I look at it two different ways, and I had this conversation earlier privately. Um, we have humane societies that are private, they're nonprofit. All they do is humane education, and they adopt animals. And the animals they adopt are their own animals. I don't think they need a premise permit. I don't think they need, they don't fall under the Veterinary Practice Act. They're their own animals. They're not offering services to the public. The only service they offer is if I wanted to get rid of my dog because I was tired of it, I could take it to them and sign it over to them and they would find it a new home. But they don't offer any services. They don't pick up strays. They don't do humane or, uh, investigations. They don't do anything that provides a service to the public other than education and adoptions. Now, go into another mode, you have humane societies that do humane or, uh, investigations and seize animals. You have humane societies that have co animal control contracts in addition to their humane function. And yes, they are dealing with the public's animals, and yes, they should have a premise permit, and yes, they should be under the full provisions of the Practice Act. But we've got one small humane society right in San Diego County that all they do is adopt animals. They do not have a premise permit, and I really don't think they need one. And yes, they do have a part-time veterinarian on staff to take care of their animals, but they don't offer any services to the public. The public doesn't take animals there for veterinary services. They don't administer rabies vaccinations to the public. They shouldn't fall under the Veterinary Practice Act. That's just how I think these should be divided out. It has to do with whether you're seizing animals, whether you're taking in strays animals, whether you're taking in animals that have the potential to be owned by the public. That's when the Practice Act should be applied to all these situations, whether it's humane society, a city shelter, a county shelter, or whatever. Okay? That's just my opinion. So we're, we, we're talking about veterinary care on intake. We were kind of started with the perform a physical exam. And the, the only other thing I wanted to say about this topic is regardless of where we put it, whether we try, can we at least vote and just agree that we like this concept and we recommend that this be allowed because it's what the board has allowed all these years. We're just reaffirming that we like this, we should allow it and let's figure out how to then put it where it belongs in the Practice Act. We like and allow what? These things to occur, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dave. We do have with us the, that section 2030, uh, 2035.5 that we had worked on, and I believe it was uh, it stated in there that it's functions for RBTs. I thought that at one point we had agreed that this could be a, a, a template for veterinary assistance in a shelter setting. And I was wondering if... Did we? Did we already vote on that? Yeah. No. No, this was proposed. Oh, okay. Okay. And I was wondering, my question is, has anything developed from this or beyond this? Um, it, yeah. So, Val? Valerie Fenstermaker, CVMA. Um, 
We did have a follow-up meeting regarding veterinary assistance. We organized, uh, Erica actually organized a small group. Uh, Christy was on it, Dr. Pulaski was on it, uh, Bonnie Lutz, uh, Dr. Jennifer Hawkins, who's with the Orange County Animal Shelter, and I was on it, and Dr. Grant Miller. And we came up, and, and our task was to look at veterinary assistance. We came up with language which I brought. It's very short, but it's similar to what Dave is talking about, and our CVMA board approved it. The Shack board had a problem with it, and I can't speak to the specifics of why they didn't like it, and Erica's not here to address it, but I thought I would at least read it to you since we did work on it. Um, it's pretty short. It would be Section 2036.6, Duties of Supervising Veterinarian and Animal Health Care Tasks for Veterinary Assistance in the Shelter Setting. And just to qualify both of the things that we've put forward, this language and what's in your packet already from the Premises Task Force, carve out the shelter setting because we've always felt that there should that should be addressed separately. So this says, um, notwithstanding subsection B of 2036.5, a supervising veterinarian may establish written orders for veterinary assistance in a city, county, or city and county agency or organization contracted to perform animal control services, which is what Dave was talking about, for vaccination and prophylactic control of endo and ectoparasites on intake. So that's where we got to, and separately from the RVTs, which have more authority than a veterinary assistant, our group felt the veterinary assistant should have much more limited authority. So I just thought I'd share that with you. I did bring it if you want copies, um, but that's where we ended our last conversation. Seems like a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. I most certainly would agree. Yeah. Thank you. Val, could you just email it and then I can disseminate it to the MDC? Mm -hmm. for, for I don't think I have it in an email. Oh. I'll, I'll I just made a copy and brought it with me, but if you want to make a copy. Okay. Yeah, I can scan it. I'll do that. So I think both of these documents are a very good starting point that we need to get the stakeholders to sit down and work out. It sounds like they already have. So as we as we kind of try and press forward, it sounds like we need to the uh, will of the group here, but we've got the language from 2035.5 that um, has been previously submitted. We needed to decide whether or not we want to consider that. And then we just heard, I think, 2036.6. Yeah, okay, was offered language on veterinary assistance in the shelter setting. Um, we're just kind of trying to brainstorm here as we move forward on this issue and gather as much as we can so that we can come back to the next meeting and actually make meaningful progress. Um, it sounds like those two um, offerings in terms of language then would, I think, resolve most of the issues with number one. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Do we want to move on to number two at this point? Okay. So the controlled substances conversation here with the pre-euthanasia sedative. Any, any conversation on that? We've got uh, this idea for euthanasia sedative. Some of this, I don't know if this is addressed in the language that we're going to be talking about a little bit later as agenda item number nine um, in terms of sedation. Yes. Anne-Marie. Go ahead. You sure? Well, I, I have real concerns with this. I, I'm, I, I don't, I know, I mean, we don't have the problem in private practice as you do, but we do get aggressive dogs, uh, even bite cases coming in that we have to quarantine until we're able to euthanize them to test them. And um, 
I'm the only one that does it because I won't allow an employee to handle them. I, I use acepromazine. It's, it's not a controlled substance that I know of until they, you know, we do it sub-Q until they're immobilized to the point I can get a, a vein or, or in a cardiac if it's, if it's necessary. Um, boy, those are heavy drugs that people who, um, I, 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 I don't know, even know if they're, are, are, are these euthanasia permitted people that are using these drugs? Boy, that, that legislation is really, really restricted, and um, I, I, th I think you're on thin ground of authorizing those medications. Yeah, Emory. So when... When Tara at our last meeting looked at the transport of controlled substances and we were looking at the, what's it called, CS, the Controlled Substance Portability Mobility Act, that thing, um, it was clear that if these individuals were working under the supervision of a veterinarian, that there would not need, they would not need a separate permit to transport the drugs, right? Because it's a supervisory, it's under a supervisory capacity. So is our concern here that they have no authority to administer them because they don't hold what? Well, they could. I, I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. What What is our true concern here? They don't hold the, perm the VACSP to uh, administer? Yeah, I'm, this is... Erica's issue, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm a little confused on it, because the way I look at it is that, okay, I'm in a shelter situation that has a premise permit, and either an RVT is in charge of the controlled substances, or a veterinarian is in charge of the other controlled substances, and the written protocol for that shelter is that all animals are pre-sedated prior to euthanasia and these are the drugs that are to be used. So that's on the authority of that veterinarian and that veterinarian's DEA license and that veterinarian's premise permit, okay? So in that, that's covered already um, the take would be that the veterinarian didn't examine every animal prior to being sedated. That would be the issue. Um, and doctor, I agree with you. There are other drugs. Uh, our policy was that the animal control officers did not carry controlled substances in the field. Um, the only time that an officer got to carry controlled substances in the field was the capture, which is now authorized. So telazol was used to capture an animal, not necessarily euthanize it. What we dispensed to the officers for use in the field was non-controlled substances, acepromazine and xylazine. And that's what they used in the field if they had to sedate an animal prior to euthanasia to move it off of the freeway, to get it to a safe location, to prevent further injury to the animal. So I agree with you. There are other drugs that can be used. But when the shelters are doing volume euthanasias, unfortunately, where there might be 50 to 100 animals on the euthanasia list that day. They're going to drugs that will make the animals go down faster. Uh, acepromazine is a little unpredictable in terms of how it sedates the animals in a shelter situation. A lot of these animals, it doesn't even touch them. Um, so it's just the protocols, but I can tell you if you go to any euthanasia literature, uh, premix is what it is, is the street name, which is a combination of ketamine and xylazine, and that is the industry standard for pre-sedating animals for humane euthanasia, and that's just the way the industry has revolved, and that is what is taught. I'm not sure where she's coming from. I think I know. In it's terms of where it's being used, because we weren't using it in the field. That's for sure. I think this has more to do with euthanasia technicians who are not BACSPs. They're euthanasia techs, and they have their own carve-out. They are only permitted to administer euthanasia, mm -hmm. not any premix or pre-sedative. And I think that's where her issue 
was framed is should they be allowed, should this be expanded so that they can do this preset of the state or administer this other cocktail before they euthanize the animal. But wouldn't that be covered by the fact that they can't get those drugs without a veterinarian being involved yeah. and then the veterinarian would already be authorizing the use of them. So right. it would already be covered. Well, I think there's shelters that can't get it because there's not a veterinarian involved and that's where we right. run into this rubber meets the road. And then if there's not a veterinarian involved then they would do just exactly what Dr. Sullivan talked about, they would have to use either xylazine or dexedomotor or acepromazine or a combination thereof. And those are non-controlled substances. If we're talking, I mean, in one place here I've read that if they have a euthanasia permit, they don't need the VACSP. Well, if they're using these other drugs, I think they definitely need to have that. I mean... The idea that the CSP was was told to us to do from the legislature. It's not our idea. Right. Uh, it's because we were the only profession out there that had access to controlled drugs that weren't fingerprinted. So I I, I think um, I think our marching orders come from higher up. Well, I I guess here's another caveat that I would throw out to expand upon what you just were bringing up. You have two, two scenarios, well, you actually have three scenarios in which animals are euthanized. Um, I, as a member of the public, can bring an animal into an animal shelter for euthanasia. And I'm signing that over for euthanasia, so technically you're establishing a contract and a VCPR in some form because you have requested a service, you have talked with that person, you have determined that that animal needs to be euthanized, and then it is sedated, and then it is euthanized. Um, so that would address one scenario. The other scenario is that once animals are past their stray holding period, if they are not deemed adoptable or deemed healthy enough to be adopted, then they are selected for humane euthanasia. And I would make the argument that after an animal, and this is that classic argument that's never been resolved, after that animal has passed its legal holding period, it is the property of that animal shelter. And they don't need a VCPR because it is their property to dispose of by law. And so they are disposing of that animal by humane euthanasia. Then the other argument is that the, uh, I believe it's the Food and Ag Code, allows for animals that are suffering to be humanely destroyed. And so you've got three different scenarios there in which animals are euthanized. I'm giving legal counsel a lot of things to think about. <laughs> Emery. Go ahead, Tara. Oh, Tara. <laughs> I, I think that it would be helpful to have a list of things that you want me to report back on if, if that's where we're going with this. Um, but I think it's... It, it would be most helpful if the board could, or um, the committee could come up with an idea of the direction that you want to go with respect to, um, I mean, I can research whether or not there's statutory authority um, or whether a, a statute or a re regulation should change. I, that's my point. If that's the direction you, you want me to go research, I can do that. If you're already clear that you want to just change regulation, then I can research that and come up with some language. I can do that as well. Um, it's difficult for me to sit here and get a sense of all of the aspects that you're talking about because you know clearly there are many puzzle pieces. Uh, but I do think there is a way to clarify a, a direction, um, perhaps, you know, if, if there's just one overarching question as to whether um, unlicensed individuals can render certain medications or drugs without permits um, in a shelter situation, if that's the question, then I can figure out whether or not a statutory change would be necessary. 
or uh, if you could just change the regulation with respect to the euthanasia training. Um, but, you know, I recognize all of the different avenues here merging into this one issue, um, and I'm, I'm happy to continue research, but what's the direction you want to go? Nancy. It seems like you're making this a lot more complicated than it really is. I think Dr. Sullivan put his finger on it, that the issue is can these people administer controlled substances, controlled substances or not? And if they're veterinary assistants, they need a VACSP, they could get one. What's the problem? They don't. Some of these shelters don't have supervisors to get a VACSP, so that's the problem. Okay, so then yeah. that's the problem. Right. That you need to identify how they can get a VACSP right. or perhaps adjust the language of the uh, legislation <coughs> for VSESP so that they have a supervisor who can yeah. do it. All right, so we've <clears throat> kind of tried to second guess what um, Erica's concerns were on this. I want to move off of agenda item number, number two here and go with number three, the sodium uh, pentabar euthanasia CCR 2039. And if I remember correctly when you were talking about this just a few minutes ago, Dave, you were saying basically there just needs to be a clarification of some sort. Yeah. Um, it depends upon how you want to read the section of the code. I, The way I read it, uh, animals are identified to include wildlife, and the way it's written with the commas and or, I would say they already have the authority to do it, but that is up to legal counsel to determine that one. Um, when we were discussing this earlier, I was my question was whether or not they were reading the regulation in 2039 to mean domestic pets or domestic animals, because the question is whether or not um, they can administer to wildlife. If you read the whole thing, it, it looks a little bit more clear that the employee shall be deemed to have received proper training to administer without the presence of a veterinarian sodium pentobarbitrol for euthanasia to of sick, injured, homeless, or unwanted domestic pets or animals. So if you're reading this as domestic pets, and separately animals, which is otherwise defined to mean domestic animals or wildlife, then yes, there is regulatory authorization to administer to wildlife, to wild animals. On the other hand, if this is being read as animals is qualified by domestic, I could see that being the issue. So it, it's hard to figure out if a clarification is necessary or not without no understanding what the problem is. Well, I, and again, I'm not sure what the problem is because there's no wildlife police that is saying, hey, you're euthanizing animals, wildlife illegally. It, it's a, it's a necessary public service that animal shelters do. Um, I don't know of anybody that's being criticized for doing it. Um, and most certainly, it's better than shooting them. And it's more humane. And um, I think the board should just say, hey, our interpretation of that statute is it's OK to do. And I think that's what they're looking for, unless they know of a situation where an inspector came in and looked at their euthanasia logs and said, hey, 50% of your logs is wildlife and you don't have the authority to do that. But I, I don't know that happening. Not aware of that. So I think, I think they're just nervous about how the Practice Act is being applied to shelter and they just want to make sure they're not getting themselves in trouble. I, I think, I like the first reading. <laughs> That's what I told you earlier. I think it's covered. Yeah, that, I mean, it seems most appropriate to read it as domestic pets or animals. And yeah. animals are very specifically defined in the Practice Act as right. everything. So I think it's a moot point. I, I guess to the extent there's a, a particular situation that 
we just aren't seeing uh, with this language. Yeah, that I, I guess I would ask Erica for clarification. Has there been a problem? Has someone complained? Uh, were you criticized? Uh, did somebody refuse to do it because you didn't have authority? I, I mean, those would be the questions. I, I was just going to ask how it is clarified, short of changing language in the in the regulation. Can a board clarify? Can yeah. Can there be something coming from the board to clarify it without changing the regulation? I, I think absolutely the board could just clarify through, you know, FAQs mm -hmm. even on its website whether or not it would enforce against uh, administering a euthanasia drug to wildlife. So to the extent it's being administered to a domestic pet, or an animal, animal also includes wildlife. Mm -hmm. That would just be the clarification, really. Mm -hmm. Evan's suggestion, since we're, um, we've got a plan of action for some of these items, and I know we're not totally through them, but it might be helpful for the subcommittee to engage directly with SHAC at this point, um, and in fact say, here's where we're at with item one. We're looking at two separate pieces of of proposed language presented by the CVMA, some of which Shaq worked on um, with the controlled substances issue, uh, trying to understand the issue in terms of whether or not it's access to these drugs because there's no veterinarian involved with the shelter. Uh, you know, this sodium pentobarbital clarify that animals includes wildlife, and, and granted, we could, will move forward with mm -hmm. some FAQs, but perhaps the first step might be take this list, dialogue with Shaq, and you have provided me with a wealth of information here today in terms of the practicalities of what's happening. And I think that would be helpful to have recorded in a document like this. So the next time we meet and we talk about this, we've got our game plan because we, will, we know now what really needs to be fixed and what just needs to be clarified through this conversation. So if the subcommittee could work on that, and Tara and I will help in any way we need to, I think that would get us further along with Shaq and some of the interested parties. So my vision here is that the subcommittee will work hard over the next few weeks to try and put this all together so that we have enough time to send Tara into 800 different directions <laughs> in advance of our next meeting. So that's, that's the dream. But we're trying to co collect all of it, just some of the facets now, so that we can, the subcommittee can understand what the heck it's dealing with. So far, a subcommittee of one, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, authority of RVTs in shelters. Oh, we we yep. skipped over B. Oh, sorry. Yes. The requirement that a person must have taught euthanasia for at least three years before being eligible to be a certified trainer must be revised. And, and I'm not sure what to do with that because it's not our regulation. Uh, our regulation says they have to have training and then we defer to the State Humane Society's training guidelines for the training. And so it's their guidelines, not ours. But the fact that it's incorporated by reference right. in 2039 and says, hey, the board basically says the training curriculum shall be provided by this group and the curriculum shall be entitled Publication Criteria for Certification of Animal Euthanasia Instructors in the State of California dated September 1st, 1997. So even though it's their guidelines, we incorporate it by reference and right. regulation, which means if they change their guidelines to remove that three-year uh, proviso, we would have to update our regulations to their new guidelines. And that, it could be a Section 100 change. And that's what I'm trying to figure out, is they need to change theirs, right. and then we just need to adopt it. We don't need to change it for them. Right. I think what this was about is, we'll, I think they're willing to go ahead and do that. They want to know, do does the board have a problem with that, and if we, and if, Shaft moves forward with changing their guidelines, will we then accept those guidelines and incorporate it by reference? I think it was more of a, hey, can we move yeah, forward? To me, it's more, to me, it's more of an administrative thing. Yeah, because yeah, they just don't have anybody that can teach right, right. now. That's their right. concern. Right. 
And so that, again, would be a communication right. that, yes, if you want to change your guidelines, we know we'd have to update our reg to match that. Dick? They did have a reason for having three years. Uh, so how are they going to replace that experience of three years? I don't know. I mean, it was there for a purpose. I'm not exactly sure well, why. Yeah. But just changing it to change it sounds like a backhanded way of doing it by doing things. Um, just to clarify, I don't know how they want to change it, but just to clarify, RVTs are automatically authorized to teach. Mm -hmm. So I did all the euthanasia training. I didn't have to have the certification. So these are people that aren't RVTs, and what they're replacing it with, I don't know. But there's a lot of RVTs out there that are teaching euthanasia. I, I don't know what they're proposing replacing it with. I think it was the three years was what the concern was. Right, so it do uh, so RV, RVTs can't teach this. That's correct. So why are they having a problem then? Just like many shelters don't have a veterinarian, many shelters don't have an RVT. So they could hire an RVT to come in and teach the course. It's a, it's a coursework, right? That's correct. It's very specific coursework and that hands-on certification. Jennifer. And I would kind of play off of what you said, because we do have people authorized to teach, we have other organizations asking to send their employees to us to be certified, so I think there is a way around it, but that's just yeah. my opinion. This really wasn't a problem until the primary trainer for the United States retired. There was a person that their business was doing this training, and they were the go-to for every agency in the United States, and then he retired, and so then it became a problem. Okay, anything else on item three? Item four, authority of RVTs and shelters. You touched on this already, Dave. That yeah, I mean, I have no problems with it being amended. I'm just not sure it's necessary, but it just means going to the legislature. Well, again, I ask, why do we need to amend something if it's covered under the code already if they're contracting with the shelter? Well, let me ask this. Is this specific item an issue for our subcommittee? That's, I don't know. It seems to be a concern of theirs. Um, is, is this a solution in search of a problem? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I, think it's a I think it's a clarification. Oh. I, I think that there's hurt feelings that the word humane society isn't in there. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there could be a big issue that I'm just not aware of, and I, I guess that would be the question I would ask them when I talk with them. That would be a very good question to clarify, and I will do such. Yes, Dick. Uh, I keep going back to uh, the work on on the 2035.5 uh, and 2036.6, I think we need more than one person on this subcommittee. Oh, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Three or four. For sure. He's rich as mine. I think we need a, a more finished product coming to us yeah. next meeting. Okay, wait, we have two people on the subcommittee. It's Alan, it's Dr. Drusey. Without violating. Yeah, yeah well, no, we probably not. You can't have three, but you might want to. We'll get it figured out. Figured place out. Yeah. one. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One suggestion is that um, after you meet with Shaq, um, you could provide any questions, materials, language um, to Anne Marie and myself, and then we can organize it in a fashion that, you know, or, or ask additional questions. Mm -hmm that should be clarified to bring it back to the committee so we can get a, a little bit more finished product yeah, uh, moving forward. Yep, Dick. And since CVMA has done a lot of work in this area, I think they should be at the table too. Yep, I agree. Okay. 
Um, anything else on number four? Number five, rabies vaccines. Yeah. Oh, yes. I would, I would just suggest that if you do go ahead and define shelter, that would solve the problem of the number four, uh, that SBCA and humane societies are shelters for the purpose of this regulation. If they're not performing these kind of services, they don't need to be included. So I, I think, and I think Dr. Sullivan brought it up earlier, that I think you really do need to have a specific definition of shelter to clarify uh, just which type of organizations are included. I agree. I've actually added item 7 and 8 to this list of 6, and 7 was the 2032.1 BCPR discussion, and number 8 was defined shelter. Right. So I already see those, but thank you. Other comments from the audience? Okay. Item 5, rabies vaccines. And again, just to reiterate, I, I just think it's simple that we should reach out to uh, um, public health and enter into dialogue to see if they are receptive. Um, their, uh, their own compendium actually is pretty um, inclusive. Uh, the compendium is their guideline, and um, all animal rabies vaccines are restricted to and by and under the supervision of a California licensed veterinarian. The level of supervision shall be consistent with Title 16 CCR 2034 to 2036.5 of the California Veterinary Practice Act. So they're, they're already deferring back to us, and this gets clear back to Decades ago, the California Attorney General ruled that anyone can administer a rabies vaccine. For years, it was thought that only a veterinarian could administer it, and then the Attorney General made a ruling that said anyone can administer the vaccine. Unfortunately, you can't find that ruling online because it's so old, but it's somewhere buried uh, in the archives. And I think we just should reach out to them and say, hey, there, there are situations that are occurring in the shelter. What's your opinion on this? And I can tell you in my dealings with uh, Dr. Fritz, uh, they're very receptive to understanding what the issues are, and then maybe we can work out an agreement and come up with a proposal. I think that staff could reach out. I don't. That's think what I was going to ask you. Would you like us? Yeah, to I handle? think staff okay. can reach out. We'll, I don't we'll think it needs to be any of us. I'd like to comment on this. Um, can we recap what the practices practices are in shelters? I had four or five. With regards to rabies vaccination. That's correct. Yeah, um, and these are just the scenarios that I'm aware of. There could right. be different scenarios. Um, they could issue what I call a fix-it ticket and require the people to get it at a later date and release the animal. They could continue holding the animal until the veterinarian uh, it becomes present on the facility and authorizes it. Uh, they could uh, vaccinate it and just say, hey, we're going to vaccinate it and uh, they could call a veterinarian for a telephonic authorization. I have another idea, but I'd like the clarification on where they vaccinated without the oversight of the veterinarian. Uh, because when we get our animals, uh, their periodic rabies right. vaccination, we get a, a slip and, and I think we can purchase it. That's correct, yes. So without- the Same thing occurs. Even without the veterinarian? Well, you have to remember the law allows a veterinarian authorized signature. So uh, the veterinarian's name is on that certificate, but an RBT can sign it, a front office person can sign it. Uh, the law allows for another signature on there as long as the veterinarian has authorized that signature. So let's talk about a scenario where the veterinarian isn't present, can't be reached, etc. Right. Uh, the person gives the vaccination and hands the slip over to the owner. That is correct. It seems to me kind of obvious there are two public policy issues at play here. One is you want to protect the public from a from a deathly disease uh, by right. inoculating for rabies. And the second is you want to facilitate reuniting owners with their pets That's in the possible. easiest possible way. Right. And I am almost I can almost bet that people who are turned away who probably also have to pay a fee to redeem their animals. Many don't come back. 
that's possible. I, I don't have any statistics on that. Plus, their fees go up. You're, you're paying for two more impound days. Ah, okay. So, um, I have a thought. We have in the past talked about telemedicine. And why can't there be a veterinarian available via telemedicine 24-7, servicing all shelters in an area or even in California. Be like getting your medical marijuana permit? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, why not? I, um, telemedicine is a wide open field. I well, there you have it. I don't know what information... I would let the doctors comment on that. Well, exactly. But, you know, I'm just a public member, so I don't, I don't know what information a veterinarian needs to authorize right. a person who is uh, able to give that vaccination to go forward. Do you need the weight or the temperature? And, and just or what do you need? Yeah. And just to digress just one second, one second, because it just dawned on me, there is one more scenario for vaccination. Uh, we would do a record search through the animal's complete record, and if sometime within the last year one of our veterinarians had seen that animal for something, we considered that an examination and we would give the rabies vaccination. And you could do that remotely as well. Yes, so in other words, if the animal came into the shelter and had an abscess and the veterinarian saw it for the abscess and did the physical exam for the abscess, then the animal was claimed out, we would consider that the exam. So why can't this be kind of a, a good case for the application of telemedicine? You can take a picture of the animal, show it to the veterinarian. The veterinarian doesn't even need to be in the area. I, I would say without um, you know, going down the telemedicine road, um, long road, um, the requirement for a veterinarian to be involved in a rabies vaccination, different from all the other things that would be utilized in telemedicine, is primarily public health. I mean, obviously it's a huge issue. And I think it, at least the way I see it, we talked earlier about people other than the veterinarian physically giving the vaccine him or herself, is to simply ensure that Whoever is giving it has authority, ability, and knowledge of how to give it, and that the vaccine has been stored properly and it's given the right way. Um, I, I'd be uncomfortable giving that authorization telemedically to anybody and then find out an animal comes down with rabies days or weeks later. What about then? Um, using the telemedicine mode uh, and still giving them a fix-it ticket. Would that just be a waste of a vaccine? Is a vaccine expensive? And the vaccine then you'd is not expensive, but the fix-it tickets are still, the problem. Still paperwork. So and we're, we're, we're kind of well, almost deviating off agenda here a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Well, I'm just thinking that there, there's a problem here and uh, there are shelters, apparently, that are circumventing the law and public policy by giving shots without the veterinarian being present. I think it's, it's unclear. There's some gray area here in general that, that needs to be brought to light. Okay. Yeah. So, but the subcommittee certainly has heard the telemedicine concept, and so that they'll, I mean, it's an interesting idea. All right. Yeah. Anything else that we want to talk about in regards to rabies? Okay, and then we've got indirect supervision as item number six. And that was, should we redefine or, or define differently indirect supervision for a shelter setting and supervision in general? And I guess that would also include awareness of the good veterinary practices. Yes, Anne-Marie. So my comment here has been the same throughout this discussion on written oral instructions, uh, direct or 
orders. And what is more commonly termed in the field, as I understand it, are protocols. And perhaps what we need to do is just refer to protocols here. Because that's what is currently being practiced and what's been an acceptable standard of practice in shelter medicine, as I understand it. Um, so I think these written oral instructions, quote unquote direct orders, is confusing as it seems like there's something more, that there's some um, verbal contact with the veterinarian at the time that these things are being administered, whether it's the you know physical exam, the vaccines, the prophylactic um, treatment. So if we looked at our section of law that refers to written or oral in instructions, and perhaps without changing statute, instead go into the regulations and define those written oral instructions as, you know, as the, um, what word am I trying to use here? Protocols. Mm -hmm. That may solve the problem. Yes. Yeah, I agree. The reason we didn't use protocols because written orders is what's in the statute. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be a good way around it. So I think we, we've done it. Yeah. I just want to make sure we didn't forget that one that I threw in about amending um, 2032.1. So we've yeah. got so item 7, that. amending 2032.1 um, to uh, potentially include impounded animals, right? Yeah, impounded under penal code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then item 8 would be to consider whether or not to define shelter. Impounded animals impounded under Penal Code 597. Right? Yes. Yep. Okay. And then I have one last one. Yeah. At least I think it's the last one. Um, it just keeps resurfacing, and we either need to put it to sleep or keep bringing it forward. It gets back to premise permit, and whether or not an RVT should could be a premise permit holder in a shelter situation. And I think that needs to just, we need to get direction from the board whether they want that explored or not. Right now, the only premise permit holders are the veterinarians. And I know in the smaller uh, shelters, they are having trouble finding a veterinarian that would be the premise permit holder. Yes, Dick? Yeah, I saw those notes there, and that really bothers me. Um, the definition of a premise permit and the reason for it, I mean, there, there's a reason for it. There's a, a, a person responsible for the oversight of the veterinary part of it. So I would say that if the community is too small to, uh, in, in order to get a premises permit to find a veterinarian, they shouldn't be doing veterinary medicine. Um, they, sh they can do other things, but... Uh, they can do the adoption and finding homes and everything else that the shelters do, but uh, that premises permit is, is crucial to the Practice Act, and any time you carve a section out of it, you're weakening it. And um, I, You know that area better than I, but I'm, and, and I'm I think uncomfortable with that. Yeah, and, and I, I understand both sides of it, and, and I think part of the issue is Yes, we've looked at the number of premise permits there are for animal shelters. My guess is there's hundreds of hidden shelters out there that we don't know about that are probably practicing veterinary medicine that don't have premise permits. And unless somebody files a complaint, we're never going to know about it. And uh, your scenario, if it's a small enough shelter, in many instances, they just contract for services with the local veterinarian. So they do have an option of what to do or they contract with the veterinarian to come into the shelter on a regular basis to provide services. I'm just bringing the issue forward again is because it's been brought up repeatedly uh, by Dr. Drusies that, um, and other people that should an RBT be allowed and we'll just follow the direction of the board. But I think the biggest problem is making sure the word gets out that who needs that premise permit. The, the big cities, the big counties, they're not the problem. They have premise permits. We already know that. 
it's as it filters down to the B and C level, uh, who do they know they need it? And I, I'm not sure we've still approached that or not. Are the number of permits going up at all, Anne-Marie? Do we know, or with the information that's being sent out, are we seeing more people coming forward and getting permits? So um, we cover this tomorrow in our um, statistical profile, and typically what do we see? At least 100 to 300 new permits a year, Ethan? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So between 100 and 300 new permits a year are being added. For but animal shelters or just in general? In general. We right. don't know the number increasing in terms of animal right. shelters. Um, but as many are added as new, we see some that don't renew. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of a constant. We, there's some years where we see an increase in... You know, I think one year we were up to about 3,700. I think this year we ended the year with maybe 36 something. So it, it does fluctuate. Um, we have more uh, premises permit, well, then I guess it would be shelters that are exempt from paying the fees. So we know that number's increased. Right. And that would only be if shelters increased in terms of registration. So I guess that that's how we would okay. know that there's, the numbers are slightly higher than they've been in the past because they don't pay the premises permit fee if they're a city county or city and county shelter. Jennifer and then Christy. Um, I'm always hesitant to support anything that might be restrictive of access, but premises permit, that needs to be RVT only. There is a reason that DVMs are the ones that hold those permits, and I think taking that away and, and opening that up to an RVT just opens up a whole other can of worms. In that case, what would stop me from deciding that I'm bored with what I do, adopting a few corgis and, and getting a premise permit and calling myself a shelter? I, I just think it's it's too dangerous to go down that road. Well, and we did talk about this last time, and, and uh, Bonnie Lutz brought up that we, as RVTs, cannot get the insurance that DVMs can get, and we're not protected as RVTs. So I can't carry the same liability insurance <laughs> that a DVM can carry, and so that would concern me. I'm not protected, so if, as an RVT, I can't carry the same insurance and I have a premises permit, I don't, I don't want the responsibility. I think the bigger issue for us in the Practice Act is RVTs aren't considered independent practitioners. They don't exist without some form of supervision or some degree of supervision. So to have them actually assuming the responsibility of a licensing or a licensee manager, managing licensee, um, would mean that they are essentially in charge of all the employees under them rendering services to the animals within that setting, but they themselves are not an independent, independent practitioner. So it seems to me that that would be problematic from a, an authority perspective if they can't independently operate as a, you know, um, independent provider, how would they then have jurisdiction over all the employees within a particular setting and, and no other line of supervision? Okay. Anything else that the committee can think to add to this list as we try and move forward on this agenda item? Are we adding this or not? Are we adding premises permit? Yeah, of the RVT. RVT? Yeah. I think the board just either needs to say yes or no or put it to sleep, you know. And okay, so during your um, So, <laughs> yeah, so the subcommittee can report yeah. to that and then the yeah. board can tackle it in their own way. But Should we vote on it? Well, this is an ongoing agenda item, and so basically what we've done is, I think, collect some information to further focus our subcommittee. I don't I, know that we need to vote on it. I mean, the recommendation in regard to number five here, well, in regard to the premise. And see, I see, I, I see where she's going. Would the MDC like to recommend to the board right. that we examine this issue and it be added to the list of, of shelter issues that are being researched and addressed. So you could, as a committee, make a recommendation to the board that we think this needs to be further researched, we'd like to you know, collect information and see what the board's wishes are, or the MDC could recommend that we don't take this on, but you could, you could call for that. 
I think this is so specific that it's not been properly agendized so that we would not have had public comment and all of that. So while I'm not opposed to that, I think we're a little out of our order by trying to vote on it right now. Okay. The, the reason I raised it was because I agree with the comments, but I haven't said anything. Yeah. But I would certainly um, vote along with the other members who made the comments. Yeah, I think there's compelling uh, reasons to not have an RVT have a premises permit, but we have not, again, we've not noted the public, noticed the public about this conversation, so it's not really fair for us to move forward with that. Instead, we're going to turn it over to the subcommittee, and then they'll come back with the report. In the meantime, we'll have uh, Tara also probably do some background on it. We are going to keep pushing forward until lunch at this point, which will be soonly. But and Doctor, and then the only other one is addressed in a later agenda item, which is the sedation. Sedation, and that's exactly. that's in a further agenda yep. item. Okay, yeah. that's all. Right. And then I do want to ask: Is there anything from the public on this that they would like to add to the laundry list potentially, Nancy? Uh, nothing to add to the laundry list, but I would like to ask if we could have a carb to representative on the subcommittee. So th this is a challenge for me as somebody who's on a subcommittee generally from time to time of two people is that we have not typically met with outside groups as subcommittee members in most cases. So when we talk about, and it's, this is an open dialogue, okay, but, but when we talk about involving CVMA, CARVTA, SHAC, I guess my impression was that that was an email communication or a telephone communication rather than a face-to-face -face meeting, is and that that satisfies kind of that checking in. Is that does that work with what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, we have uh, members on our board who work in shelter settings and are interested in giving input, and yeah. however they can give input, that would be fine. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I think that's great. Okay, so where do we go from here? So we have a subcommittee that we still need to define who the players are in that. They have these lists of, of items to work through, and they have until our October meeting to come back to us with some recommendations. And then how would our, our uh, members communicate? I would imagine that they would be... Yes. Well, I was just going to say that. I mean, I know personally, my email's public. You can go on SVVMA's site and get my email address. Um, but if you were to send me a list of your members that are, you know, in their areas where they happen to be of interest or something, and you know I'm on a committee and you said, hey, this is a group list of our members and this is the areas of their site, and this is for me personally, I'm not speaking for the committee and said, you know, if you, want to con if, if you want to contact them regarding this issue, that would be helpful to me because I don't know. I, I reach out to a community that I'm in contact with or that I know is, is out there that I have, you know, people that I have worked with in the past. So if you want me to contact somebody from, from CARPTA that you know, then send me their email address because that's how I'm going to reach out. And Nancy, you have my email address, same thing. Just email me the contact information. Okay. Um, can I just make a clarification here? Okay. No. No? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think that um, only the subcommittee members should be receiving or communicating with okay. outside um, associations or interests. Uh, so we just maintain the, the size of the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, what what could happen is uh, Anne Marie can receive information and then uh, submit it to the subcommittee members for their consideration and potential questions and and uh, have a dialogue that way. Okay, send the email to you, not to Dave. Nancy, you can send it to Dave. He is on the subcommittee. I think we're just we're waiting to see who the other member is, but I can notify you who the members are that you can dialogue with directly to Nancy. But you're welcome to send it me and I can get it to the subcommittee. Val. So just an overall comment on behalf of Erica, who's not here, and I who've 
been involved in a number of meetings and and just she and I talking some of the issues and, and maybe the the premises permit issue we've discussed can be overall lack of communication between shelters and veterinarians especially in in uh, more rural areas smaller shelters and that's something as associations she and I have discussed maybe it's our responsibility to facilitate communication or maybe there's something we can do or some you know dialogue we can facilitate or some way of helping the shelters and the veterinarians to have relationships where there may be lack of effort poor relationships bad communication whatever it may be maybe we as associations can help with that so that's just an overall comment of something we've discussed and maybe something we as associations can do to help the situation Any other comments or questions at this stage? It looks like lunch is here, so why don't we take a break at this point, and then we'll get back to agenda item 7 after lunch. 45 minutes, so back at 1230.